Stipe versus Cormier, wow. You know, here, here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. They weigh in. And the weigh-ins matter, right? Because there's only a few things in this game that's true. And numbers are one of those truths. Stipe weighs in at 230 pounds. Now, that will represent nine pounds less than he is than his absolute minimum weight ever. That will also represent 11 pounds less than the last time he fought Daniel Cormier. What do you make of that? Hold the thought. Daniel Cormier weighs in at 236 pounds, which represents the smallest he's ever weighed in at, <clears throat> excuse me, since he's returned to heavyweight, which was only against Steve Bay, which represents 12 pounds less than he was in that fight when he was 248. What do you make of that? I was asked this right after the weigh-ins. And my answer holds true to this moment, which is, yes, it means something. Yes, it does. I don't know what it means. But I do have a feeling when this fight is over, that's when that talking point will then be reinserted, not before the fight. If you were to look, let's start with Stipe. If you were to look at a guy who loses 10 pounds, it is lean like Stipe, full of muscle, no fat on the bone. That means he took off 10 pounds of muscle. So what would the advantage to that be when you're fighting in the heavyweight class? Would the advantage to that be that your endurance is a little better? Yes, that would be true. Is your speed going to be a little bit better? Yes, that would be true. Is it also true that now you've got a bigger guy who loves to push guys up against the fence and maybe you're going to have to deal with that more? Is it also going to be that your power comes down just a little bit? Mm, that would make sense. Not necessarily true. If your speed goes up, sometimes your power can be even better. But you see where this becomes interesting. And also with Daniel, why are you coming down? Some people said they saw Daniel Cormier cutting weight that morning. A number of people saw Daniel in the sauna. That's confirmed. The question becomes why? Now, I know Daniel. He likes to get up. He likes the sauna. He likes his body warm. I cannot relate to that on, on any kind of level. A sauna for me only has bad connotations and bad memories, but I know a lot of guys, they have a sauna in their house. They want to go heat. They just feel good, warm. So I don't know what one had to do with the other with Daniel. If he, in fact, did pull about 10 pounds off, as some people are predicting, or if he was just in the sauna warming up. I don't know. It was speculated that he wanted to show the world and he was in the state of California that has pretty strict weight loss uh, regulations that he could be within striking distance of 205 pounds should he beat Stipe and want to move back down to fight John Jones. I don't know that I buy that, but I'm in for the story, whatever. Either way, he came down in weight. What does that mean for Daniel? It means some of his wrestling isn't going to quite be as effective. It means he's going to be a little bit quicker on his feet. It means he's going to be a little bit quicker to block. Get to the shot. Okay, great. Right? I mean, same argument for Stipe. If it's good for Stipe, it's same thing for Daniel. They both came down. But what was interesting, because it reminded me of the very first fight. When they had their very first fight, nobody would really listen to Daniel's argument as he was trying to plead it for you. And Stipe went off at a two and a half to one favorite. The one and only reason that people were happy to put their money on Stipe, at least as the narrative was told, is he's bigger. He's just too big for Daniel. That's why it was kind of a shock when Daniel outweighed him by eight pounds. It was a little bit of a shock for the first fight. You now can't give Stipe the number one advantage that you've been giving Stipe. But your tickets, you've already been to the window. Tickets in your wallet. Okay. So for the second fight, they both come down. Let's just get into the, uh, the fight itself. One of the reasons this was so amazing is because Stipe, everything that could go bad in Stipe's life in that fight went bad in that fight. All in the first round. But that's the round, if you're his opponent, that you want it to go bad in. You want to let this guy, you want to take his motivation away right now. You want to take all those positive thoughts and ideas that he has had over the last year to year and a half, and you want to, you want to reinforce that you're the champion of the world. And that is what Daniel Cormier did. He picked him up. He swung him through the air. He put him down. He kept him there. He pounded. He wore him out. He frustrated him. And Stipe regrouped. And you cannot go down as a great unless you deal with great adversity. You just can't. Even if you are a great, you can't go down as a great. It's unfair. Roy Jones Jr., greatest boxer of an entire decade, never had that huge fight because he was so dominant. So the storyline falsely got told that, well, it's an easy division. There's just nobody else in it. No, the division was great. He was just clearly better. So it is important that you deal with these moments. Stipe dealt with those moments. 
And round two wasn't a whole lot better for Stipe. He was he managed to stay off of the bottom, but he's in a dogfight. And he's getting his licks right back in, but he's losing the round. Now, round three, I heard a, a number of people were saying that Daniel was running the tables on him. That's simply not true. That is not what happened. Stipe definitely won either round two or round three. One judge gave him round two. One judge gave him round three. One of those judges had it right. They were very close. They were very competitive. They were very hard. But Stipe all of a sudden is getting takedowns of his own. Stipe, from the first round forward, defends every takedown. I mean, he was making adjustments. And it was incredible. And Daniel's doing a great... Daniel's staying right in there, and he's not listening to his coaches. His coaches are begging him. Bob Cook said, and I quote, Dan, in between uh, rounds, Daniel, this is the opposite of what we discussed. Go out and wrestle. Daniel didn't do it. And I don't think it was a uh, stubbornness by Daniel. I don't even think he he was liking something that his coaches weren't seeing. I think Stipe was keeping him off him. I think Stipe was doing a good job with the footwork, keeping that jab real busy, falling up with a cross. I think he was just creating that distance, and Daniel didn't see what he needs to see. Before he can go in and change elevation, try to close that distance and get to the guy's legs or body as a wrestler, you, you need to see something. And there's a number of things that you could say that would trigger that in your mind and you're going to come in. I don't know that Daniel saw it. I don't think he was ignoring his coaches. I really don't. He will let us know. We'll find out sh uh, soon enough. I think Stipe just found a way to keep him at bay. So you get into the fourth round of an absolute dogfight. Okay. You've got at least one for Stipe. And now Stipe starting to steal the fourth, which is letting you know, oh my goodness, we're going to go into the fifth all tied up. Stipe finds a body shot. Boom. Sleep it slips outside. He finds the body shot again. And I'm watching this with Cejudo, and I don't I don't pick up on it right at first. I mean, I see him doing the body shot, but I don't pick up that that Stipe's found a weapon here. And he's found a tool and he's found an opening. I don't pick up on that. Henry Henry Cejudo has to sit jail. He's he's found this body. Daniel's got to put his arm down. Daniel's gonna have to make adjustments. Stipe's gonna keep hitting him in the body. As Henry's telling me, Stipe hit him two more times. Stipe must have hit him in the same spot 12 times. It could have been more like 14 times. He just kept doing it. Now, before any of you go, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. You know, hit a guy in the liver and, uh, you know, hit him again and hit him again. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It does make perfect sense. To explain to you how hard it is to do that technique <laughs> would take me all day. To explain to you how hard it is to do that technique on the defending world champion would take me all day. To explain to you how hard it is to do that technique when you're fatigued and tired and losing rounds and the whole world's, I mean, Guys, you don't see that shot in MMA. You'll see it in every boxing match you watch. Go pick any boxing match at random. You'll see it. You will not see that in MMA. Particularly to then be able to go back and find it in. Go, go back. I mean, Stipe just found the shot, and it was working. It was changing Daniel, and Daniel wasn't quite figuring out how to adjust to it. Now, the answer would be if he had done what his coaches had told him to do, and he just closed the distance and set his hands on him, you don't have that shot open. But that, that that's not what we were dealing with. We were dealing with a real... Uh, a pugilistic matchup here. And Stipe just kept going and kept going and kept going. And it changed the champ. And that Daniel Cormier was not backing down. He was not wilting to it. But he's a human being and his body, it's, it's hurting him. It's hurting him bad. It's sucking the gas out of his tank. It's making his hands go down. It's putting him in a bad position. He's wincing a little bit. He's marching forward. He was all hard. He was all grit. He was all tough. But Stipe keeps finding the shot. Boom, Stipe. Stipe tricks him. He dips outside just like he'd always done. Boom. Except this time he comes right down the middle, casters him in the face. I mean, it's just a really, really great fight. Those are the X's and O's. Stipe gets a stoppage, but he also proves himself because of the adversity that he had to go through. It also proves himself as a man of his word saying, I know I can beat that guy and I'm not going to fight anybody else. I deserve that fight. Turns out Stipe was right. He sure as hell did deserve that fight. No way we, no, none of us would be foolish enough to argue that now with what we know. But it also changes the future tremendously, right? It, it, that fight cost John Jones $8 million. Put it that way. That's how much it just changed the future. John Jones versus Daniel Cormier will never even be discussed again, let alone happen again. It will never even come up again. The only way you're going to get Daniel back and I can all but assure you guys, you are going to get Daniel back. But let me play along. The only way you're going to get Daniel back now is Daniel versus Stipe. And quite frankly, I'd love to hear from you guys. What would you rather see? I think, I think 
you guys would say, well, if I had to choose between Daniel and Stipe or Daniel and John, I'll take Daniel and Stipe. I think that's what you say. And one of the things that was important for most of us, if Daniel was to fight John again, is that they do it at heavyweight. We got to change the weight class. That's not simply just not going to happen. Now Daniel has a true trilogy fight, a true one. John wasn't really a trilogy fight, don't forget. Yes, it was the third fight, but a trilogy by colloquials is supposed to mean two guys fight, this one guy won, and the other guy won, so now we go and settle it in the best two of three. That's not what happened. John won, John, then you got a no contest. So it could have been a third fight, but a trilogy. I mean, he's got a chance for true trilogy. I really think that that leans towards Stipe. I do believe that will happen. Daniel's already alluded to wanting it. Stipe, not for nothing, is a man of his word. I mean, Stipe, Stipe lives his life by a code to the highest of levels. And Stipe used the argument against Daniel of, you owe me a fight. I gave you a fight. You owe it to me to give me a fight. If we're to follow those same words and do nothing else, then that, yeah, that's true. So now what did we do? Well, go fight again.